Hi, um, what a privilege to be in the company of these speakers today. I want to talk to you about a big problem that's going to require big solutions. And the biggest problem that I know about, and certainly the biggest problem I've ever studied, is climate change. It goes, of course, to the top of our sky, but it goes to the bottom of the ocean, it goes to every corner of the globe, it's every nation, every peoples. It's political, it's economic, it requires debate, it's scientific, it's engineering. It's the biggest problem you could ever imagine. And I spent four years learning about that problem as an atmospheric chemist in Cambridge, and this is what it looks like just to learn about the problem. It's a total data deluge. It's completely overwhelming. So I just want to start with, with one piece of the science, and I can't take any credit for it, but it's ice core data. It's a data set that the scientific community is extremely proud of, and a very brave set of scientists sets off to Antarctica every year, and they drill down deep into the snow, going back in time. So this is the Epica Dome Sea ice core data I'm going to show you today. It goes more than two miles under the surface of the snow in Antarctica. And it goes back 800,000 years in time. So let's just start with the very beginning of that data, because I think that's too big to start with. This is the first 15,000 years going back in time, looking at that global average temperature. And it's normalized to what we think of as normal in the 20th century. So it's a temperature anomaly, we call it. And if you look at the data, really what jumps out is actually it's been remarkably stable. We've been really lucky to live in a very climactically stable temperature regime for the last 15,000 years. But what is 15,000 years? Let's overlay on this some key moments in human history. Well, at the beginning of the graph, you're looking at agriculture, the invention of agriculture, the beginning of the sedentary lifestyle, tools, specialization, arguably the form of much communication and polit politics that came after that. At the coldest part of this, tra this graph, actually, is when we came over to North America as Homo sapiens sapiens. So we weren't even populating the part of the world that we're sitting on and standing on today. And as we move forward, we have the invention of the wheel 8,000 years ago. We have the beginning of the Bronze Age. The first cuneiform script is the first human script. It's pre-hieroglyphic pictorial script. We have the earliest Chinese dynasties, right around the same time as modern Abrahamic religions as we know them, the beginning of democracy. We have the printing press 600 years ago and the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago. So basically, human history as we know it. But this is just the beginning of the data set. So let's zoom out and look at more of the work that the scientists have done. This is 800,000 years of data. And the first thing that you see is that actually temperature has swung much more dramatically over time than it has when we've been living in the world that we know. And just to orient you to those 15,000 years, that's where it falls on the chart. That's pretty intimidating. All of civilization as we know it has evolved in this extremely stable climactic regime. On the other hand, nothing about us as forward-looking communities of rational organisms cannot survive radical things like climate change or glacial interglacial periods. So on this graph, our predecessors, half a million years old, the earliest evidence of shelter just after that. The innovation to use cooking with our food comes after that. Our species, 200,000 years ago. And even the most human things, like art, from the last ice age. So we're stuck between two conflicting problems. The first is that civilization as we know it, as we experience it, has never, ever survived a dramatic change in, cl change in climate, as we're destabilizing climate today. On the other hand, communities of Homo sapiens sapiens have gone through much more radical things. So at this point in my career, I studied the problem, I got sufficiently overwhelmed and terrified, and I took a right turn and I came to Silicon Valley. And one of the great things about Silicon Valley is it's one of the most hopeful places in the world. <laughs> it's true, you can't fail that much if you don't believe in promise. So, it's incredibly hopeful. One of the sort of dogmatic things that we hold as a community to our hearts is that innovation happens all the time. In fact, it's happening at an ever-increasing rate. And I almost put up Moore's Law, I resisted. Um, but I could, I could show you a similar chart for pixels or storage or any type of technological change that's increasing over time. So I want to tell you two stories based on that belief, true belief in innovation. And the first is actually how we innovate our interaction with technology itself. This is what computing looked like 30 years ago. What does, that, what does that mean? In fact, that's what computing looked like to me as a PhD student, which was totally scary. But this doesn't really mean anything to most of the population. You have to understand code, file systems, software, firmware, the structure of what's going on in your computer. It's not very approachable. 
This is what computing looks like now. And if you want to throw something away, there's a visual representation of what you're doing on the file disk, and no one needs to understand that really complex abstract stuff that's happening. You want to move a file, you take the mouse, you move the file. You want to open something up, you click on it, it opens up. This is incredible, and it's only getting better. This is what technology looks like now. You want to interact with technology, you touch it with your own fingers, never mind the mouse. This is pretty amazing. Our ability to approach and engage with technology grows. And one of the coolest pieces of technology I'm going to show that I can also take no credit for is actually a technology that powers Xbox Connect. It's an Israeli company called PrimeSense, and you can interact with technology now without touching it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You take a photo without ever interacting with the device. So that's the first story, and it gives me great promise, because as more of us engage and interact with technology in a human, comprehensible way, we get entrepreneurs from everywhere. <laughs> the youngest app developers, app developers that I know about are in middle school. How cool is that? And that only increases the pool of entrepreneurs and innovation happening in technology. So the second story, it's earlier on in its life. This is what a utility bill used to look like. This is code. Who understands what a kilowatt hour is? In <laughs> actually, in this community, maybe a lot of people. Um, <laughs> what I actually what I think is interesting is this looks surprisingly like interacting with MS-DOS. But it doesn't really give you any information that's human understandable. It tells you to write a check, and it tells you how much, you, maybe how many kilowatt hours you used. But it doesn't tell you where your electricity goes and your consumption, your relation to other people. This is what utility bills are starting to look like, which is very promising to me. This tells you something about your utilization, the different appliances they're using, your comparison to neighbors, indoor versus outdoor use of water, things like that. This is the first step to engaging with a very abstract con concept of energy and climate. This is the beginning of the Macintosh pro forma of energy. This is a building management system where you watch real time how energy gets used in your building. Amazing technological innovation that we can monitor these things live. And this is just the first step. We're starting to see entrepreneurs sprout out from all over the world the same way we do in technological innovation. This is a young Malawian man who built his own wind turbine based on understanding what was going on in the energy environment around him. So that's anecdote. The second anecdote is a lot shorter than the first. And that's because it's just the very beginning. But the energy and climate problem is more complex than the computer problem on your hard drive. Understanding that electrons flow in the opposite direction of current, what's going on with resistance and all the different app, app, um, appliances in your house. And then there's this stuff called carbon dioxide, which is odorless and it's non basically non-toxic to human beings. And what is it doing to our atmospheric system? It's really confusing and abstract. But we're at the beginning of introducing human engagement with those two concepts. And I'm extremely hopeful about entrepreneurs engaging with that process increasingly over time. It's our responsibility to encourage this climate of innovation for energy entrepreneurs. And it is the only way that we will innovate on behalf of our climate. Thank you. Thank you.